Kia ora. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our teaching and about our students' work. My name is Anke Nienhuis. I'm a lecturer in the Industrial Design Department at AUT, Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, New Zealand. I have a background in industrial design and my teaching and research at AUT focus on sustainable product design and I also look at how to teach this effectively. I'm presenting here together with my colleague. Kia ora, my name is Joshi Kalyanji. I'm a research fellow and lecturer in the School of Art and Design at AUT University. I have a background in applied textile design, working across a range of applications and disciplines. In our presentation today, we'll talk about how we aim to ground our teaching in sustainable design practices within local material-based opportunities so that students feel empowered to design for a better future. So at AUT, we run a three-year Bachelor of Design program with industrial design as a major. In this program, foundational skills of iterative design practice, human-centered design, and form giving are introduced in the first year and are then applied and extended over the following two years. With increasing global challenges, the role of designers needs to evolve to encompass broader societal and environmental considerations. For example, in response to climate change, the current linear models of consumption need to shift into circular and regenerative solutions. This has given rise to new design paradigms such as life-centered and material-driven design. And design education needs to shift to accommodate these new models of thinking and making Concurrently, design education is at risk of becoming less hands-on for reasons such as a decrease in funding and the condensing of teaching courses, the high cost of spaces, workshops and resources, and the pand pandemic. This interferes with the traditionally practical approach to design teaching, where students learn by doing. A method that has been adopted in the papers we're discussing today is material-driven design. This is a hands-on learning approach that puts the spotlight onto materials as active participants in the design process and presents an opportunity to make good material choices even before you start to design. Good choices for the user, the application and the environment. The two projects we'll talk about both focus on a specific material, namely HDPE plastic and wool both with the aim to create value in addressing local waste problems. Starting with a material provides students with an opportunity to generate innovative solutions rather than iterations of existing products and explore novel material applications. The material discoveries drive the product design and take place before problem solving a user need or experience. We also want students to work on local real world problems that they can relate to and to enable tangible change. In this first project, we focused on a waste material that most students themselves were involved in creating, namely discarded milk bottles at our university, which goes through a large number of plastic bottles every year. In this eight week project, third year students aim was to transform or upcycle these discarded bottles into useful, valuable and recyclable products to be made and used by university students and staff, creating a circular economy at the university, making change on a small systems level. We started by investigating theories, principles, tools and strategies related to design and sustainability, such as life cycle assessment, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and circular economies. were to use the already familiar iterative design process with a focus on human-centered design and meeting user needs. But first of all, they were encouraged to experiment with the milk bottle plastic and extensively explore the technical, sensory and expressive qualities of the HDP plastic, which later informed their product design proposals. There was a steady supply of plastic milk bottle materials, so students were not limited by their financial means which can happen in making focused projects. They were to design products that took full advantage of the identified properties and characteristics and discovered or created material qualities. Students also investigated potential recycling systems and manufacturing methods to process the material on site. 
They were encouraged to create material-based, innovative, change-making solutions, and with that, turn the assignment into a positive and memorable experience. They quickly showcased three student projects, first showing some of the students' material exploration, and then their final design. This student created an innovative way to make felt out of the HDPE bottles and lids, extruding and spinning the melted plastic and then cutting and felting it. While researching what products might be needed at the university, the student learned about noise issues in the library and applied this innovative material to alleviate this problem. The developed felt material was turned into desk dividers to be used when studying at the library. The dividers have excellent acoustic properties and shield students off visually to help with concentration. The outside frame of these dividers is also made from the milk bottle plastic. Here you see another student's exploration of the material's properties and aesthetic, shredding, melting, stretching and pressing the milk bottle plastic and taking advantage of black and white contrast and its aesthetic opportunities. Just to explain, the milk bottles the university uses have three plastic layers, the middle one being black, apparently to shield the milk from UV rays. This makes for a distinctive pattern or marble effect when the material is melted. In their research, this student found that students at our university generally don't like to sit in many of the common areas as they feel too exposed. The final design outcome were hanging divider screens to create more privacy in those public spaces and to also have a positive aesthetic impact on the space. This student didn't select a project in his third year but chose to embark on a master study investigating the exact same theme. In addition to investigating the many material properties and how the material could be manipulated, this student specifically looked into ways of achieving interesting and pleasing surface colors and patterns by using not only the milk bottles, but also the variety of different colored lids. This design output was a collection of unique stools made at the university, mainly making use of the easy meltability of the HDPE creating sheet material and then heating and bending those sheets into three-dimensional shapes. From short-term milk bottle to long-term stool, he created a very durable product, effectively upcycling the material. And at the end of its life, the stool can be recycled again into another stool or into any product that is needed at the university at that time. We received positive and insightful feedback from the students. They talked about the tangibility of change, the story and appeal of the material, and being able to have an impact. It was a project that students found meaningful and that they could relate to, designing for and creating a circular economy at their university. Many of the students indicated they were proud of their innovative outcomes and felt empowered and more confident that, as designers, they can make a difference. Although a successful project, we know recycling is only one strategy to respond to environmental concerns and we need to explore many other avenues and materials, including biomaterials, like in our next project. The strongwall problem is another local issue, but is more broadly positioned within sheep and beef farming across the country. Strongwool is a locally produced natural fibre. It's a coarser fibre than the premium branded merino and has traditionally been used in carpets, insulation, upholstery and denim. It has much to offer with regards to its functional and aesthetic properties, but over time and with increasing use of synthetic materials, strong wool is now perceived as a byproduct or waste product. With strong wool making up approximately 90% of New Zealand's total wool production, this perception and the lack of demand is a significant problem for New Zealand's wool growers. It currently costs farmers more to shear their sheep than they are getting for the sale of the wool. More recently, there has been significant government and industry investment to promote research into locally sourced natural fibres. For strong wool specifically, there are three key bodies in this area. Each targets a different area of the industry or consumer segment, but all reference a shift in demand and price of strong wool, being dependent on new, high value applications. 
problem presented an opportunity to develop a studio-based paper for Year 2 students. At this point, the students are halfway through their degree. They've been introduced to the design thinking toolkit, human-centred design, and varied fabrication technology, largely working with hard materials. This paper was developed to extend these foundational skills with a focus on introducing students to fibre or soft materials and a materials-driven design approach. Specifically, the project asked students to take an experimental and exploratory approach to playing with string wool to better understand its properties and potential. And then, based on their findings, provide innovative design solutions that shift the perception of strong wool and the valued user-centred product design. As for the milk bottle project, this project was split into two key components. The first is a fibre and fabrication study, and the second, the development of a product concept generated from the findings of the first study. the materials driven design method, materials define the tactile, technical and experiential qualities of the product. The students are provided with strong wool in a range of forms, from scoured dag wool, so cleaned but no further processing, through to yarns and industrial felts and buds. This material is donated by industry partners. Access to free material is a key component of the paper, as it encourages students to be explorative and experimental in their fibre study. Alongside the material, Students are also introduced to new fabrication and processing techniques. Also like the recycled milk bottle project, it's important to contextualise the work. The practice-based element of the paper is supported by industry speakers. So we start with the farmers that donate raw fibre for students to work with, before introducing them to a range of partners from throughout the supply chain, from scouring, carding and spinning, to designers of end applications. These talks are presented as open discussions in the studio. As well as reinforcing the need for novel solutions to the strong wool problem, partners will often share steps being taken to address the environmental impact of farming and processing the wool. Students can ask questions, dig into details, share their work and receive feedback. In this format, it's also the intention to level the playing field. Industry experts are approachable and we want to reinforce to students that they have valuable ideas to share. As students work through the first phase of the project, they are identifying the technical and experiential qualities of the fibre and are considering what these qualities can offer. In the work shown here, you can see there is a broad range of fabrication techniques. Both additive and subtractive techniques are being used and the fibre is being transformed into dynamic forms. So just some thoughts from the first phase. Um, students can be slow to start. The concept of freely exploring a medium with no intended product outcome can seem abstract as a design method. However, once a few have embraced the making, it generates a buzz around the possibilities and the other students are quick to join in. We also noted that the project activates a strong studio environment. With hands-on fibre and making processes often relying on labs, students need to be on campus from the first class. This encourages work to be displayed in the studio and opens discussions within the cohort. Lastly, we found that in some cases, an unexpected discovery during experimentation stalled the process, with students not knowing how to draw from the work to move forward. So from this first phase, students generate and ideate a concept that exploits their findings around the characteristics of wool. They then have seven weeks to develop this into a product. There is still a lot of making in this phase as students work through an iterative development of their products. Alongside this, we have some sessions with industry experts, such as acoustic or filtration experts, where students can get feedback on their concepts. The last part of the project requires students to shift their mindset to their intended user and to consider how they will communicate their concept to this audience. This is an important step in reinforcing that user needs should be considered throughout the development and that users will not necessarily be sold on a good material choice. Rather, the material needs to be brought together in desirable product outcomes. In this final phase, products and posters are exhibited in a showcase. This starts as an open session with industry, allowing students to share their outcomes and receive feedback. We find that students are excited to share their designs with the experts they have met previously and are comfortable seeking feedback. 
The showcase is then opened up for public exhibition. And just briefly, you can see from these slides the breadth of applications that are generated from exploration of a single natural fibre. There was some insightful feedback from students that reinforced the need for the various components in the project format. With regards to working on a local problem, students noted that it felt more personal, that it felt like they were doing something for their country, and that they were contributing to a future solution. They also found it easier to design a product that had a meaningful backstory, and noted that it was empowering being able to address a New Zealand issue. With regards to material and making, there were references to the experimentation being the most enjoyable part of the paper. Students noted that they loved testing and pushing the limits of the material, loved being able to touch and feel the material, and that they enjoyed the hands-on aspect. And lastly, reflecting on the industry engagement, students noted that talking to industry guests motivated them to research further. It gave them a sense of urgency around the problem. They found the talks insightful, was one of the best parts, and that they liked the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one talks with ex experts in the studio. So just to reflect on the outcome of both projects and how we might move forward. We think it's important to acknowledge environmental and societal concerns and consider how we address these within our teaching. The two projects discussed today aim to integrate aspects of this within real world local projects. Positive outcomes included that students could relate to the problems presented. This motivated students as they felt they could have a tangible positive impact. Also, a material-driven design approach allowed for and encouraged open-ended, creative and intuitive experimentation and made for innovative design outcomes. The projects were built on traditional industrial design processes where students engaged in familiar problem-based and solution-oriented learning. And lastly, the supply of materials ensured students could explore and experiment without limits. These are key aspects we would like to take forward. The intention of these projects was to empower the students and give them confidence to be part of the solution. We'd also like to consider how we can contextualise the making within new and evolving design paradigms, ensuring students can be responsive to the changing world around them. And we think it's important to continually review and adapt projects to address current local problems. Our students have the potential to make change happen. And hopefully, through local materials-based projects, we can help them achieve this. And with that, we have come to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. We're looking forward to getting some feedback and to discuss design and sustainability education. So please do feel free to get in touch at any time.